All right, so um, where do we start? I think a good place to start could be uh, what you call a local theory of mind. I recently watched a talk you gave on that. Part of the reason I think it would be good to start there is it kind of builds upon something that we have discussed before in the previous conversation. So the thing we did talk about was your study uh, about the differences in hallucinatory voices that people hear in America, Ghana, and India. And uh, the short, crude version of that is people in America seem to be like assaulted by voices that they don't recognize. Uh -huh. And people in India might hear like a voice of a relative giving them advice. And people in right. Ghana uh, often hear God. Right. And then in right. India... and. <laughs> Thanks. And then in India and Ghana both, uh, the overall experience is just more pleasant or at least neutral, while in America it is a very like nerve-wracking kind of thing. So there people are more likely to say that they like the experience mm. or that they wel or they welcome the experience. And Americans uh, certainly in that first sample and to the, and the large large majority of people I've talked to since uh, people feel that the voices are harassing and assaulting right you know th this that study is still like one of my favorite just pieces of information ever i love telling it to other people and it's mm -hmm. uh, partly because of like the reaction that i noticed in myself when reading that like some article that i saw about it and the reaction that i've noticed in people who i share this with is a similar kind of trajectory of thought at first you're very surprised that such a study even exists. People don't necessarily know that there are people, mm -hmm. you know, doing this kind of research. Then you're surprised at the finding that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people, the, the the way people experience schizophrenia can be so different because of the culture. And then, mm -hmm. you know, after a little pause, you kind of think, well, wait a second. I mean, that's, that makes perfect sense. That that should be kind of obvious that culture, I mean, culture affects us in every way possible. We are cultural beings. And so it makes sense for the, uh, you know, the experience of schizophrenia to be different in different cultures. And then what you're yeah. left with is not even the finding itself, but the questions that that opens up, the relationship mm -hmm. between culture and our, you know, direct experiences, our thoughts, our emotions, mm -hmm. our hallucinations, mm -hmm. if we have any, uh, mm -hmm. and, and how we treat our experiences and all that kind of stuff. And so since then, um, you have built on this and uh, mm -hmm. you've done more work with those three places. Mm -hmm. And I think you're you're making an argument that these three cultures has have like, distinctive ways of relating to the mind and mm -hmm. uh the way I, I i heard you put it uh is interesting so it's like in america people tend to think of the mind as a kind of a private possession or like a private mm -hmm. citadel of some sort mm -hmm. while in india people might think of it or relate to it more like um to a social process of some sort mm -hmm. And then in Ghana, there's a kind of an emphasis on the ability of the mind or thoughts, the inner life of a person to affect the world outside. Mm -hmm. Is that the right summary? Right. Yes, that's great. And, and, and the mechanism of that, what is, so you're saying like there's, there's something within the culture that yeah. shapes the way we think about our experiences. And that right. in, in, in turn kind of, creates the experience like we pick out different parts of what we might be experiencing is that the the drift i think so i mean i use the phrase cultural invitations mm -hmm. so there are things that happen in the world around you that happen to a lot of you know so that we call it by culture and we mean that the things that you you see and observe and you draw inferences about, you're making judgments about, you're kind of coming to conclusions about. And for those to be cultural, 
you'd expect that they would be shared by a lot of people. That would be something that would be relatively common in your world. And the way that I imagine the way that I tell the story to myself, I think that humans are always conflicted. They have conflicting intuitions about their own experience of their thoughts. So we have this mental experience of consciousness. We're aware, we, 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 we're aware of thinking to some extent. We're aware of being an I. We're aware of, you know, an intelligence that observes our, our experiences in space and time. And, um, and I think that we have, you know, developmental psychologists and others, you know, could document some conflicting invitations um, that I think humans everywhere have the intuition that awareness is part of the body and it goes to the body. Mm-hmm. And but you could could also there are many many things people say and experiences they have, or even just the experience of dreaming that can lead you to draw the conclusion that something about your awareness is different from your your body. Um, you could have the the intuition that um, what you think affects the world directly. So this is like a very basic part of um, magic and religion and childhood. You know, Americans have this little game. Kids uh, will not step on a sidewalk crack because it will break their mother's back. And of course, nobody that believes game it. in and, Russia as well. Yeah, so there's like nobody really believes it, but it's a game, and the game depends on the idea that it might happen, that there's some consequence. Right. And so, and yet, you know, all humans, you know, perfectly well that not everything you think affects the world directly, but humans are also we're all, you know, having if we want something passionately to come through, we, we often wish for it very, very hard. You know, if you even if you're watching a sports, you know, a sports performance, right? It'll move your body to, you know, make the ball move a certain way or something. You know, it's like there's this, there's this kind of wishing affects the world, but you know that wishing doesn't affect the world. You own your thoughts. Your thoughts are generated by you. That's a very basic human experience. But we also have all of these words and phrases to describe intuition. Uh, to just, you know, it, it came to me, I was inspired, it was the muse, we have, we can be overwhelmed by anger, it can feel, you can have this wash of feeling that seems to come from the outside. And so there are all these kinds of, you know, very human contradictions. Then you've got a lot of stuff in culture that supports or doesn't support both sides of that contradiction. So, you know, reading about Harry Potter, you know, Harry Potter is definitely invites you to think that, you know, the trained mind and a good wand can affect the world. But, you know, there are a lot of people who treat Harry Potter like fiction because it's fiction. Um, But there's a lot of, you know, then there are people pray together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some people who go to church and the church is very clear that you should pray. And the prayer doesn't affect the world directly. It kind of goes through God. But it's, but nevertheless, there's all this kind of sense that, you know, and there's a sense that what you you think you should attend to and, you know, you shouldn't think bad thoughts about people. And maybe that's a particularly Christian invitation. So, you know, if you're a Christian, then you have a church that is very articulate about the fact that you're, you know, being like a good Christian is not enough. You must have an inner experience that, you know, asserts that you are a good Christian, that you hold Jesus to be your, your savior. And so I think in different social worlds, there, while there are all of these contradictions people's experiences is complicated individual people are different they're di- different they have different traits and styles but they're also also pieces of that world that invite you to think kind of to bend on those contradictions in little in somewhat different ways 
one of the evident ones in um, a, an American setting is the importance of psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, in America, people highly value their individual identity. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot in the culture that tells you that that individual identity has to do with what you think, your opinions, your choices, and, you know, parents good parents offer their kids choices about what to eat for breakfast and they value their kids willingness to make that choice which that an interior kind of judgment we have all of these ads for psychotherapy and all these people are in psychotherapy which kind of really suggests that what you feel and think is really really important and you want to sort it out so that it is good it mm-hmm. matters how you experience it um, and we don't have a tradition that's highly developed about ideas about witchcraft, or at least not not now. Um, it's just people sort of think that that's, you know, thoughts are, nobody knows your thoughts unless you talk about them, which is why you need to go to a psychotherapist to get them sorted out so you can talk about them together. Um, Ghana is sort of, I understand, you know, best because there's such a big, feature of the social world which is that there's this tradition of thinking about some people special people as having uh, the capacity to bewitch mm-hmm. and you know in different social worlds you know ghana is going to be different from the sudan but you know there are these ideas that the um some people some special people when they have negative thoughts those thoughts can move into the world and do something. And sometimes you need a little help. Sometimes, you know, you can't have a social world of things that everybody's negative thoughts always affect the world. But, you know, so any system of magic or witchcraft is going to constrain how those thoughts work. You'll have special people, or they'll need to be specially skilled, or they'll need to use a special object, or they'll mm-hmm. need to say certain special words. Um, Probably, this is some work that we're doing, um, probably the more the special person says words out loud, the more people will think that those words have power, that the, you know, even if nobody else can hear them, if they're spoken out loud, then they'll have, they're more likely to have power. And, you know, and depending on the power of the person. So if you, so in Ghana, people will often say, no, no, and I mean, Anger can only affect the world if, if it's a witch who's angry. And then the witch has to do something. But you keep talking and they'll, um, and they'll say, well, but really powerful witches, they don't even have to know what they're thinking. They, it just, just happens. Or when somebody is really angry, it doesn't matter you know, whether they're trained as a witch or not. It'll, it'll just happen. Mm-hmm. And so you've got, I kind of imagine a, a human in that setting Drawing all these inferences, making quick judgments about what the mind is capable of and what it's not. And even though the human is just complicated, complicated ideas, there's a kind of little cultural push to think that the mind has powers. Um, and I think, you know, what I see in Chennai is just this phenomenon that I'm kind of aware of that you, that you can see, which is that people are kind of very aware that you know hierarchy is very important and so that what the the, the the significant older person thinks about a younger person can be more important to that younger person than what the younger person thinks so this comes from what just the idea that hierarchy is important that well i mean it's people will talk about the South Asian and East Asian world is interdependent. Mm-hmm. So there are lots of ways that people evaluate this. I'd say my, my friend and colleague Hazel Marcus will, you know, have people draw the people around them as, you know, draw draw your social life and represent yourself as a circle. And everybody else is a circle. And then she'll do things like ask, you know, are the circles close together or far apart? Mm-hmm. Um, are, you know, and, and Americans, we, we actually just did a version of this where we took these, you know, little circles, yeah, pictures of circles, and you say, which best describes you? 
Yeah, you, what's, what best describes you and your family? You've got like one pattern of circles where you've got one, these separate little dots. And there are other patterns of circles where the circles are overlapping. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and again, the world is complicated. But Americans, on average, are a little more likely to choose the separate dots. And Asians are a little bit more likely, on average, to choose the interconnected dots. Which doesn't mean that there aren't Americans who will do a totally interdependent dot and there aren't Asians who will do a separate dot. But there's a little kind of difference in pattern. And the you know then and the ethnographies of South Asia, um, uh, you know, will really describe people in relationship to each other. Like there's um, a great a great book by Madison Mines that sort of says you know people become independent over time. So that's the achievement of maturity is that you become your own person with your own thoughts. But that's not the way you grow up. That's not the way that you are encouraged to, you know, by the way that you sleep with other people. Like Americans always put people, put kids in their bedrooms to develop their independence on their own right, after right. the age of 18. That doesn't happen very, very, you know, other places. And so, so I think there are these little differences uh, or many, many differences that can be small that people should begin to draw, have expectations about how thoughts should work, what thoughts can do. And they shift a little the, you know, your capacity to, or you, uh, I actually think they shift your, the experience of your body. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we see is that in Ghana, you know, people will judge that when God speaks, God speaks with more of a hearing quality. There's more of a sense that you know, Americans have a really sharp boundary between their mind and their world. They, there's a lot in their culture that invites them to think that their mind is really separate from the world. And their mind is a different kind of stuff. Their mind is immaterial. You know, thoughts aren't real. They're kind of epiphenomenal. You have, you know, you have thoughts. They're very important to you. They are who you are. You can't catch a thought and put it, put it in a box. You know, that it's a different kind of stuff. And I think in Ghana, there's just, um, you know, if you've got you know, what Charles Terrell, Terrell would call a more porous mind, a mind in which there's a sense that intentions aren't just in, in humans, but they're also out in the world, and what you think can kind of affect the world, and what happens in the world kind of affects you and in, in supernatural ways. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've got less of a sharp line between mind and world anywhere. Anyway, mind stuff is not wholly different for world stuff because it affects world stuff. You know, that anger, it's not just affecting your body, it's affecting somebody else's body. And so, and I think that is why when we talk to people about experiencing, you know, so so God speaks. So that's what it is to be a certain kind of Christian. So this is like in all of these countries, in this particular part, you're talking to Christians of the same kind of denomination, right? So I have spoken to, um, so we've done, my specific comparison before we did a big project was with Christians. Mm -hmm. So I was looking in three churches that had, um, were what you would call new charismatic evangelical Christians. These are churches which are all, kind of similar in some ways. They all share many characteristics that emerged in the 70s. Um, these are the kinds of churches people think of as the mega churches. Um, they're high tech. They tend to be, you know, middle class aspirational at least. And their pastors are all, all reading kind of the same books. And in all these churches, God is a friend and he will talk to you. Mm-hmm. So the first iteration of this project, process, you know, I went to... Uh, I'd been doing this work in that kind of church in Chicago and then in the South Bay, California. And then I went to a similar church in Accra and a similar church in Chennai, so Ghana and and India. And that was also where I was talking to folks with schizophrenia. So that was also people in the same city who were, were different kinds of people. 
And then what we've done since is to do a big project in which I'm working, also working with people who are the field workers are, you know, PhD, PhDs in anthropology. They are highly competent. They've done their field work in that part of the world. Um, they speak the language, they uh, know the world well. And so they have been doing um, a, a more complex comparison. So they are doing, we're looking for an urban, new charismatic Christian church. We've also got a rural church like that. Mm-hmm. And then there are two other groups that are different. So in Thailand, there are Buddhists. In Ghana, they are traditionalists, or what are called the Akumfu. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., they're, they're Methodists, because Methodist probably is you know, representative, representative of Middle America. But, you know, that's what our historian told us. You know, and then we've got a group in Vanuatu and a group in China. And so, and then we have other ways of asking questions of people as well. So we're, uh, we are doing surveys with undergraduates and we're doing short face-to-face interviews and we're doing, you know, interventions with kids. So there's a lot of, and, and, and only this much of that data are, are, are back. I mean, we just, you know, we don't have very much data back. It's, um, but there's enough to see that at least the difference between the U.S. and Ghana that I saw seems to hold up. And uh, then just like, and sort of Thailand's kind of an intermediary case, um, and Vanuatu's kind of like Ghana, in the respect of the materiality of the interaction with God. Mm-hmm. So all these Christian churches... They all share the problem that they've said that God is a friend. He's going to talk back. So the Christians are making a judgment about they have to identify when God speaks. And then they have to, you know, and they have a sense of what what that feels like. And what I think we see is that for the Americans, who highly value this interior experience of mind, God speaks back inside the mind, for the most part. And they're really, and they tend not to. They tend to be worried that if they have auditory or sensory experiences, other people will think that they're crazy. Mm-hmm. And that is just less true in those other domains. Um, in Ghana and Vanuatu, you have kind of the most, the highest number of people in this small sample, but in many different samples, saying that this, you know, that the spirit talks, feels really external. And when it talks, it has a hearing quality where you can see it, or you can smell it, or there's something that's more physical about the spirit. So it's, it's as if people aren't pulling, it's as if in America, I think, the people make a judgment about what's real that's really categorical. It's yes or no. And, ha- and the question is, is it of the material world? Mm-hmm. And then the spiritual stuff is complicated and messy. But there's sort of mind stuff and there's stuff that's real. And there's a sharp dividing line between them. And then the spiritual stuff, which is kind of messy, can- tends to get kicked out of the material world, I think. Or people... Something like that. I mean, I think that what people, what happens with spiritual things is that people are really making judgments about events that feel non-material. They feel Mm -hmm. more, you know, betwixt and between, sort of mental, sort of out there, sort of in between. And Americans seem to kind of default towards experience, making the judgment that they're more interior, and I think experiencing them that way, and that other people are making a different kind of judgment. I have a weird example in mind that I'm very curious about your take on. Have you heard about this ancient Egyptian god with a head of frog by the name of Kek? Kek, that's... Yes. Yes, nothing about it. 
There's a whole book. I I, I talked to uh, on, on on this side. I talked to uh, Gary Lackman, who wrote a book called um, Dark Star Rising. And the argument of the book is that uh, he's so he's been writing books about the history of different kinds of like esoteric movements and thought, and uh, he's used to this being kind of a fringe topic, uh, a niche kind of interest. And in recent years, he started noticing a kind of resurgence of that kind of thought in the oh. political milieu of not just America, the world generally. And so he points to like Donald Trump, who's a devotee of po power of positive thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently, Steve Bannon uh, made references to some like Italian mystics. Uh, there's some people in Russia oh. of a similar kind of disposition. But the example that, uh, you know, stood out for me the most is this thing with the internet and memes and how they affected the election, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the 2016 election. And the, the story there has to do with, so there was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize it as, as quickly as I can. So there is, there was this, comic book character Pepe the Frog. Completely innocuous mm -hmm. character, just uh, little comic oh. strips. He became popular on the internet. He became a meme, became kind of uh, morphing into different kinds of things. People would use it in different ways. Then it entered kind of the political dimension. Uh, so people on 4chan who like to provoke people who you know uh, are, are into just kind of spreading chaos for the sake of it for the fun of it started uh making images of this pepe the frog as donald trump as hitler as a okay. kkk member donald trump himself posted like a picture of himself as this frog on twitter so it became it, it suddenly huh. became more prominent um then in parallel to that these people are also into computer games. And one of them, World of Warcraft, there's a peculiarity of the game. If uh, members of two different tribes try to talk to each other, uh, the message that you send becomes gibberish. And an acronym they used, LOL, you know, used for laughing out loud, that became Kek, just because of the peculiarity of, of this game. And yeah. so you have these two huh. things in parallel. People using the little frog character uh, for provocation, for uh, messing with people. When amused by this, they would start replying instead of LOL as before, they started saying Kek. And somebody else found out that there is this ancient Egyptian god of chaos whose name is Kek oh. and who has uh, the head of a frog. And this suddenly became this whole phenomenon. There's like a whole explosion of huh. memes with this, you know, a, a huh. reimagined uh, version of this ancient god. Huh. Uh, you know, people are playing with this. People are uh, sometimes being very, uh, what should we say, you know, provocative with this. Uh, then the what what is now now known as the alt right the kind of nationalist decided to play a part in this actively and they embraced this little frog as their sigil of some sort it spilled into the offline world uh there yeah. are like political rallies where people yeah. uphold flags of kekistan the imaginary country that is ruled yeah. by kek the god of chaos and all of this is driven to to a large extent is driven by a kind of make believe maybe playful kind of right. uh relationship with this idea that thoughts are causative and the right. way so you were talking about different ways um you know people get a kind of affirmation you know god maybe right talking to you audibly or it's kind of like a feeling in the case with these people it was so one example of this sort of communication that they thought they had with the god of chaos 
was yeah. that when you post a meme with Kek or with Pepe on 4chan, the number of the posts, so there are like random numbers that are assigned to posts there, you are more likely to see like double digits or triple digits, the same digit in a row within that number of the post. So that's so interesting. I have wondered for a while whether um, the internet is changing the way people think about their imagination, whether, whether yes. that it's becoming sort of more magical. That is, that is the reason I'm bringing this up. So Lackman talks about it as, he talks about the internet as a kind of externalized imagination. It's not real. That's really interesting. But it is something you interact with, and in case right. with with this particular phenomenon, there is this, you know, idea of thoughts being causative and memes being causative, and you put something mm -hmm. out there and you see how it, what happens, right? So this is great. So this is Peter Lachman? Gary Lachman. Gary Lachman, L-A-C-H? Yes. And does he publish in the the real world or he yeah. does yeah no he's he's a pretty okay. pretty uh respectable i think writer he i think he's been published by like penguin okay so uh let's see the, the what am i trying to 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 point to with this story uh I thought about this when I was listening to uh mm -hmm. your talk in so you're you're talking about different mm, ways people relate to you know this whole sphere of of ex human experience in different cultures and you said that in america it's you know that, that there is less of an uh, acceptance of the idea that thoughts are causative and this is an example of you know this is mostly americans doing this thing and i was i was thinking so i i see kind of two ways of looking at it either Maybe the culture is changing a little bit towards mm -hmm. that more magical thinking, or mm -hmm. because of the um, fragmentation of culture. Maybe there are pockets within the American culture yeah. where this is totally acceptable, and now uh, maybe some of them become more noticeable or more influential in this case yes, maybe because yeah. of the internet right so one of the things i saw in among the evangelicals in america was what i started to describe as a hyper real god mm -hmm. so they they had the, i thought there was um americans and we know this now through through our comparison and i think it's true anyway you know americans when they talk about god are really concerned with whether god is real so they give you arguments, they say they've demonstrated this, and then they give you spiritual experience, and it's that God is real. I know it's real. Um, but what they also do is they, they talk about God. They are, they're aware, because they live in a secular society, um, they're often very aware of their own uneasiness about whether God is real. Mm -hmm. So there's a, so that's partly why they're giving you all these reasons, and there's this kind of scientific argument, and then there's this well, and I really felt it, and I kind of it's a mystery, it was crazy, I really felt it. But then they'll do things. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called *Mere Christianity*, big deal in this world, and he said, "Let's pretend in order to believe." So people of faith people of whatever faith have always used the imagination i mean because you have to because you know the the spirit is invisible you know there's a, a an invisible idea you've got to represent them but c.s lewis was being very i thought very 20th century in saying pretend in order to experience is real because pretend implies that it's not real and so it's this kind of paradoxical thing. It's it's different from the imitation of Christ. It's this, you know, it's pretending that God is real. And the church that I was spending time in did the, a bunch of, really encouraged people to do paradoxical things, like to put a cup of a second cup of coffee on the table so that God could have his cup of coffee. Where is this? 
It was in America. This is in California. Okay. It was actually the, the, the pastor I'm remembering was actually in Chicago. But you can get books to, that tell you how to do this. And, you know, they'll talk, they'll be, there's one of my favorite books that has this little boy in a Superman outfit that's the, an adult Superman costume on the cover. And the title of the book is Naturally Supernatural. And it's all about how you kind of have to be a little kid to mm -hmm. experience God, but you have to allow yourself to believe in something that you believe not to be true. But the fact that this kid is wearing an adult super, Superman outfit sort of, sort of suggests there are layers of, you know, interpretation upon interpretation that is just like very much part of this world. So I need people who would like put out a, a dinner plate for God at dinner. So they would have dinner with God or they'd go for a walk with God or they'd have a beer with God or they'd sit on a park bench and they'd sit with God and God's arm was around their shoulders. And they have this very complicated epistemological stance. So it wasn't that they had a simple continuum and there's something that's really real here and then there's the non-real here mm -hmm. and God's kind of in the middle. It's more that they had, it seemed to me that they had a very clear sense that certain things are real and certain things are not real. And sometimes it's just very complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it was the signaling of the complicatedness um, that I thought was really, that I ended up calling the hyper real God because they, people, you know, they could see perfectly well that there was nobody sitting there at dinner. They knew perfectly well that nobody was drinking the coffee. They knew perfectly well that God was not going to actually drink the coffee. Um, and yet there was the coffee to help them experience God as more real because they were doubt, doubting their own capacity to judge that God was real. So they were allowing themselves to play with their own sense of reality to enable them to be comfortable with God's realness. Mm -hmm. And so, th so that I think is not so you don't find that in old and older churches you find this kind of stuff with churches that imagine themselves as reaching the unchurched so these new charismatic churches so they're and and some churches are, are appalled by it i mean so another thing that's common in these newer churches is that god is presented like a great big teddy bear you know, it's all, you know, becoming Christian is all plus, uh -huh. you know, and you, you join the church and everything is great. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, they, they don't really, they're not selling hellfire and damnation. They're not, um, you know, it's only after you're in the church that um, somebody once said to me, oh, yeah, well, you know, hell is always implied. And it's like, yeah, but nobody ever talked about it. Like it was went to church for four years. Nobody ever talked about hell. And, uh, and, and so I do think there's something that's a little, that's complicated in a secular society. Um, I, think, I think you're right that the internet or just the things digital mm -hmm. has just made things so much messier. Um, and I think there's probably a story about numbers that, um, you know, there are, because there are so many people, you know, you can meet so many new people on the internet. Right. You can find social support for ideas that are unusual. I mean, like, um, like one of the, the groups that I've, uh, I've been, begun to pay a little attention to are people who make invisible companions uh, called the, tulpas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about it a little bit last yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's kind of great, but it probably depends on the fact that there you can find thousands right. of people, right. and you know, and they're all you know different versions of that. So I think that's really interesting. Now, so you've studied so many different uh, groups of people, kinds of people who have a different kind of relationship with, let's say, reality or themselves, or the way reality and themselves interact. Does that lead you to any, how should I put it? Like, so 
here, here's one way of, of approaching this. Uh, in this same talk that I heard you give about the local theory of... Uh, oh, local theory of mind. Right, local theory of mind. You said that um, with any mental event, it, it seems that two things happen very quickly when, when something happens in our mind. And those are we make a decision whether it's a thought or a perception and whether it's our, it's, it's me or it's not me. Right. And that made me think of uh, practices like Buddhist meditation, where right. if I understand this correctly, you know, you're encouraged to pay very close attention to every mental event that happens or physical event right. that happens. And right. that's supposed to lead you to a kind of non-dualist view of those things. So thoughts and perceptions right. are not different. It's just an experience. And yeah. the self is uh, has a kind of illusory nature. And there is mm -hmm. really no difference between something happening inside you and has something happening outside of you. Both are just right. experiences. And the claim there, right, within that tradition is that this is a more accurate way of looking at things. Right. Do you have any sense of, like, are you just curious about all of the different ways we experience these things in different uh, um, environments? It's a very good question. Um, and I, I, I am going to have to go in just a few minutes. Okay. Um, I think... I'm mostly just curious. I do think there are costs to what I'll call the citadel model of mind, mm -hmm. um, which is that, you know, the sense that, um, you know, we're sort of alone in the universe. Our mind is our castle. Everything inside the mind is both very important, but also not real. Um, that I think can be costly. Um, it is, I think it does, so it means that people have, I think it goes along with uh, the sense that the world isn't really alive, that the, because the aliveness is in the, is in the mind in some sense. It, and it also goes along with this, this risk that if something happens to the mind, then the self is completely destroyed. Right. Um, so I, so I, I do think there are risks, um, and I would like to say that I have become a Zen master and mastered all of those risks, but it has not yet happened. <laughs> so you, do you feel you're like you are a representative of this American way of looking at things? Oh yeah, I mean <laughs> I, 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 I mean I struggle in various ways not to be, but yes, yes, and. Um, and, uh, you know, so um, I try to examine my thoughts and feel kind of a more of a connect connection, you know, stuff like that. But, yes, absolutely. I grew up in a home in which absolutely we were, and this is why I became so interested. I, I grew up in the home of a psychotherapist who really felt that, mm. you know, we weren't going to know our, 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 you had to know, you people had to share their feelings. that you would only know feelings if you shared them um, and that this was a terribly important part of what it was to be fully adult. And that's a very idiosyncratic way of thinking about the mind. Okay. Yeah. So I, you have to go now, right? Yeah, I do. Okay. All right. But it's uh, been really good to talk. You, you asked very good questions. Well, I'm I'm very happy to talk to you, and if you ever have the time, I would be, you know, I have another page of, of all these questions written down. Right, right, right. Okay, well, maybe in, in a few months then. Okay, uh, thank okay. you so much. Take care, Nikita. Bye-bye. Right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>